great to see all of your faces. Let's turn to our neighbors one more time. Kind of smile at them. All right, good to see all of you again. Um, <clears throat> Uh, beginning today, we're starting a brand new series on the Epistle to the Philippians, uh, which is how many chapters long? Who knows? If you know how many chapters Philippians has, without cheating. Four. Four. Four chapters, yes. Four chapters. And uh, I think if we divide it just right, uh, by the time we finish this series, we'll be... It'll be Thanksgiving, I think. Uh, so um, it's a short epistle, but nevertheless, it is filled with wonderful messages and that God wants to convey to all of us and all of God's children. So I'm excited about the series. And um, today, I was informed that it needs to be short because we're having a small group meeting today. So I'll do my best, but I can't promise anything. Um, <laughs> So I'm, again, uh, happy to be preaching on the book of Philippians. Now, folks, imagine with me for a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. You come home one day and you open up your mailbox and there has arrived a letter from a dear friend of yours that has you know, lost touch with you for a long time and you got a letter addressed to you by that friend. And you're so excited, and, 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 and you, know, you can't wait to open up the letter. So you rip it open, and you open up the letter, and you read, start to read the letter from the top to bottom. And uh, it, it, in the words, I mean, you find things like you know, how wonderful that this guy is doing, and you know and how he's happy, and his joy is about his uh, situation, and how he's also happy for me every time he thinks about me. And uh, things like that, things with wonderful messages, and you're just uh, being filled with tears because you're so happy for the fact that your friend is doing well and that he's happy. And then towards the end of the letter, he writes, you know, uh, Tim, I'm so happy uh, to have uh, uh, written to you, and I hope to write to you again, your dear, f dear friend, Paul, uh, from prison. <laughs> And you're about to close the letter, and you go, what? From prison? You're thinking, the reason why he's doing so well must be because he's uh, living nearby somewhere in the beach, you know, like in Hawaii, or at a nice resort type of place. I mean, he must be doing good and doing very well for himself. He must have a good job and good family and well off and financially and just everything, you know, security-wise. That's what you're thinking, but then at the end of the letter that you find that he is writing this letter from prison. It's a shock. And it makes you wonder, what's making him so happy? He's in prison and he is so happy and filled with joy in his heart and that he is also filled with joy in his heart every time he remembers his friend. Gotta make you wonder. And you're thinking, you know, he must have misspelled it or something. Prison, there must be like a hotel name after prison. <laughs> but no, he is writing from prison. Folks, that's the situation that Paul is in. That's the situation and the circumstance. That's the backdrop uh, where you know, Paul is writing to the believers in Philippi from prison. He wrote several other epistles when he was in uh, prison. He was using his time wisely and he was very industrious. And he wrote many letters, uh, uh, among, some of, among which were saved in the, the canon, the, the, the Bible that we have today, which we're very fortunate to have. So one of the letters that he wrote was to the Philippians. And that's the letter we have today. And Paul writes to the believers of Philippi, while he is in prison, he is in Rome. He is incarcerated in Rome, and he is awaiting, you know, a, a trial before Caesar. He's about to be sentenced, you know, either to death or he, to be sent somewhere else. You know. So more torturous moments are awaiting for him. He is not able to 
visit his church or uh, or or uh, you know or call them or anything. All he can do is to get re receive reports and or to write letters to them. That's all he can do, and, and to pray for them. He wants to minister to them, but he can't. He is locked down in that place. He is locked down, and he's oft times beaten, and he is deprived of sleep and suffering from malnutrition, and yet in his letter, it's all about he is filled with joy and encouragement. And he is also thinking about the Philippians, and every time he thinks about the Philippians, he is also filled with joy by thinking about them. See, look at the way he's opening the letter. Look at the way he's opening the letter. How is he opening it? He says, Paul and Timothy, servant of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. What does he say? He says, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he makes it sound like he's at a wonderful place. And it makes it sound like he's, uh, he's trying to encourage people who are in less of an encouraging environment. You know what's going on? It's, it's like you're, you're chatting with your friend at a Facebook. You're traveling. You're having fun. You're having a good time at a five-star hotel in Hawaii. You're sitting at the beach, right? You're writing to your friend who's working in Seoul, right, day and night. And what do you say? You're, oh, greetings, brother. Uh, what do you say? What do you say? Uh, you know, I feel for you. May you be encouraged. You know, uh, greetings from our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, you're trying to encourage this brother. But the thing is, the truth is, he's not in Hawaii. He's not sitting in a five-star hotel. He is sitting in prison. And he is writing to people who are in better place, who is sleeping in their beds, who are eating better food, who are being comforted, who are able to enjoy their friends, you know, uh, friendship. He is alone. If anyone needs to be encouraged, it is Paul. But Paul says, I want you to be encouraged. Greetings. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters, from Jesus Christ our Lord. And you got to think, what? What's going on? Has he gone crazy? Has he finally gone mad to be writing this way? See, the way you open your letter or the way you greet each other really actually describes what you're interested in at that moment or it describes your circumstance. Think about the way Koreans greet each other. How do we greet? We say, you know, when you run into someone and we're an elderly in the morning, what do you say? Have you had a good night's sleep, right? Pops out each of just right? Have you had a good night's sleep? That's how we greet each other. Now, that does not mean, have you had a good night's sleep? Have you, did you rest well? That's not what it meant initially. Initially it meant, were there no bombs dropped nearby your house last night when you're sleeping? <laughs> were you not, or not any of your children abducted last night? Or uh, 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 did you not have to flee to Busan or something, you know, uh, because there was gunshots? See, we just went through the war, the Korean War, right? We went through terrible and difficult circumstances. And that's how the greeting, the words came about. Did you have a good night's sleep? Isn't it? Right. It is. Did you have a good night's sleep? Or, or, or else we would say, we run into somebody and we'd say, uh, did you eat? What a strange way to greet another person. <laughs> have you eaten yet? Have you had dinner? Uh, any foreigners here? Have you heard other Koreans speak that way? Yes, yes. Right? She's not just saying. <laughs> what strange way to be greeting another person. If you think about it in the global context. Who greets another person that way? Have you eaten? <laughs> Have you eaten? Because we went through a time where our parents starved most of the time, right? They starved. They barely had enough to eat for even one meal, right? See, your greeting describes your circumstance. 
the way, the proper way Paul should be opening his letter should be filled with words like, Dear my brothers and sisters in Philippi, I'm dying. Help. I'm miserable. I'm lonely. Do any one of you care for me? If you do, then you will come and visit me in prison. He will be filled with like, you know, anger and sorrow. But he's not. He says, brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he opens up the letter. And he says, I am always, the word notes the word, always filled with joy every time I remember you. Every time I remember. Meaning, every time he thinks about the people, the believers in Philippi, he is filled with joy. Folks, he is thinking about Philippians, and he is filled with joy. If you go back to books like Acts chapter 16, Philippians weren't all that nice to Paul in the beginning. You know, there was a time when uh, there was a demon-possessed girl, and uh, he visited the town of Philippi, and demon, there was a demon-possessed girl, and, you know, he, uh, 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 he prayed for the girl, and the demon you know, fled the girl. And, and she was set free from demon possession. But uh, she happened to be, like, you know, a fortune-teller type of girl, and, 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 the, and her owners were Philippi, Philippians, right? And, and they were angry because she no longer was able to tell any fortunes, right? And she, uh, they, they uh, grabbed Paul and Silas and they tried to uh, stone him. And all the people, all the citizens together, they tried to mock him, stone him, and beat them and things like that, right? They weren't all that nice. And then how is it possible that every time Paul remembers these people that beat him, right, and tortured him, he is able to say, every time I think about you, I am filled with joy. When was the last time you thought about someone else besides yourself or besides your friends or besides your uh, family members? When was the last time you thought about someone else and you were filled with joy for that person? No, really, not. ask yourself. When was the last time you thought about someone else besides your family members or besides your closest friend and you were filled with joy because of that person? By the look of your faces? Not much. I want you to look around. I want you to look to the person next to you. Are you filled with joy looking at the person? <laughs> <laughs> what did he just go, bro? Oh. <laughs> Think about it. That's, Paul is filled with joy every time he looks at the person. Now, folks. When I moved, uh, first, when I first immigrated to the States, when I first went to the States, and uh, <clears throat> my father was there already, and uh, uh, it was my father, my mother, my two brothers, and myself, and it was a family of five, and uh, we moved to the States, we went to Virginia, and uh, my father, we had gotten an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment, that was filled with cockroaches and ants and it was in a very poor neighborhood, and uh, but when I went there, I was happy. I was happy because, you know, compared to any uh, places that we used to live before in Korea, it was just so much better. It was carpeted. I've never seen carpeted houses before. It was carpeted. I mean, you know, one time my mother uh, woke up in the morning and you know and, and she went to the kitchen and there was an open can of. Uh, Coke sitting on the kitchen counter and she grabbed it and she drank it and, and she almost choked herself to death because uh, the, the can of Coke was filled with ants. Overnight, the ants got into the, the Coke and, and she drank the whole thing. And it's protein anyway. <laughs> it's also nutritious. But yeah, that's how, that's how terrible that you know, there were pests and, and there were insects everywhere. But you know, by anyone's standard, it was not a lovely house. But it, the, the, the apartment was loved by our family. We loved it. See, folks, we are 
it's one thing to be loved by God, and it's another thing to be actually lovely. Do you think you're lovely? Do you think the people next to you are lovely? <laughs> right? Every time you look at other people, do you, do you see loving things in them? See, that's the thing. The house that we're living in was not lovely, but it was loved by us. We are not lovely, but we are loved by God. That's how God's love towards us is. It's very subjective. When it comes to loving human beings, God's love is not objective. It's very subjective. How can you love us? It's hard enough that it, I need to try hard, very hard, to sometimes try to love myself. Even myself. And loving others, that's impossible. See, folks, people around us, we're even including ourselves, we're not lovely people. But God is saying, you are loved no matter what. You are loved. Has Paul forgotten what Philippians did to him? Has Paul forgotten how unlovely these people are? But he says, I am filled with joy every time I remember you. Why? Why is this? Why is this? Well, let's turn to verse Verse 8, this is what it says. God can testify how long, how I long for you, for all of you, with the affection of Christ Jesus. Because of the love of Jesus Christ, I love you. I am able to love you. Right? That's what it says. Because of the love of Jesus Christ. And he goes on, he says, and this is my prayer, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit and righteousness. He is, his language is filled with hopeful words. Right? Why? Why? Because he is looking at his brothers and sisters through the lens of Jesus Christ, who has loved him, and loved others unconditionally. And here's another thing for us. The reason why we're having such a hard time loving our brothers and sisters, the reason why we always say, you know what, I love you, Jesus Christ, oh, tarami, we sing songs like that, oh, hey, Jesus Christ, I love you, and blah, blah, blah. But by no means they're lovely. See, they're not so lovely, are they? See, it, 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 if I ask you, you know, do you think God loves you? Most of you will say, yes, He does. But if I ask you, do you think God likes you? That's another question, isn't it? <laughs> do you think God loves you? Yes. Do you think God likes you? Uh, sure. See, we tell other people that we love them, but the honest truth is we don't like them. Oftentimes. We don't even like ourselves. But Paul says, I love you, and I'm filled with joy every time I remember you. Now, this is why. Not only is it looking at his brothers and sisters through the lens of Jesus Christ, through the affection of Jesus Christ, but this is what's happening. This is what he sees that other people do not see. Look at verse 4. It says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Well, here's the thing. He sees them as partners for the gospel. Do you see your brothers and sisters as partners in the gospel? And, and he says, and he says, being confident of this, he is confident 
that he who begins, who's he there? Who's he? Who's he? God, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What is the day of Christ Jesus? His second coming, the day of his return, right? So, God who has begun this good work in us, he is the one who will be faithful to carry that work into completion. Not us. The reason why we have such a hard time loving other people or looking at them in a lovely way is because we want them to be complete. But they're not complete. Nobody's perfect. But we gotta be we gotta be able to remember that God who began a good work in those people. He is the one who is going to be faithful to carry that task into completion. Amen? Amen? That's what you have to remember. We are a work in progress. Repeat after me. I am, I am. a work in progress. <laughs> yes. Think about it. An artist is drawing something. You know, something that you can't even understand or make out. What, what is that he's drawing? You know, something abstract or whatever. It's a work in progress. You know, it could be Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he could be drawing something, and you may walk in in the middle of what is whatever he's drawing, and you know, you know, you, you can look at the canvas and you can criticize all you want. Hey, what is that? Those are just some lines and some some funky drawings and some abstract things that are, that you have put together, you know, thrown together on the canvas. What is that? You can criticize all you want. But think about it. It is Leonardo da Vinci. He's drawing something. And he, it is yet to be completed. It is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece in progress. We are God's masterpiece in progress. Folks, that's why we need to stop criticizing other people. Start with our families. Son, what is wrong with you? All of your friends are getting A's and you're getting B's and C's. And what's wrong with you? You need to start any harder. Honey, why is your cooking so bad? <laughs> I can't take your pinch lunch anymore. Oh, you know. Possibly. Awesome. Or husband, why are you so short? Or whatever. Right? <laughs> We're constantly complaining, complaining, complaining. Folks, you need to understand that your husband, that your son, that your daughter, that your wife, they are a work in progress. But nevertheless, they are whose masterpiece? God's masterpiece. God is still working on them. And you're constantly stepping in and you're saying, this is wrong, that is wrong, this is lacking this way, this is lacking that way. We're constantly criticizing other people. But here is Paul, looking at the people of Philippi, and he is filled with joy. And he is happy every time he remembers that, oh, you guys are partnered in the gospel with me. And I know, I know that God who has begun a good work in you and me, he will carry that work into completion. Who's going to complete it? God will complete it. So Paul was able to eliminate all of his complaints. And all of his jadedness and his perspective of, of these people, he is able to set aside all of his personal feelings and truly and honestly, deep down from his heart, he is genuinely expressing joy and gratitude towards the people of Philippi. He is really happy every time he thinks about it. Folks, that's why you need to have a little patience when you look at people around you. Something's wrong with her. No wonder she can't fit in anywhere. We constantly criticize and talk about people behind their back. And you know, no wonder this person is that way. No wonder this person is that way. Something's wrong with him, but something's wrong with her. We love to criticize. But before you do, before a word, a thought comes out of your mouth, you have to remember 
That person that you're about to criticize about is God's masterpiece. He or she is just simply a work in progress. God is not finished. And who are you to say, I'm finished with this person? God's not done with that person. But we are so easy to give up on people. I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm finished with you. You're impossible. Folks, we're not lovely people. We're not so lovable. But here's a fact. We are loved. By God. No matter what. That's just who God is. That's just who God is. We are loved. Because we're a work in progress. God has yet to complete this masterpiece. And folks, I want you to have hopes every time you look at yourself, look at your friends, your family members, look at your neighbors, and look at the people, of, uh, other members of the congregation. I want you to know that they are a work in progress. That every time you look at them, that you all, you too can be filled with joy and encouragement by looking at them. You know what? You're my partner in gospel. You know what? You're my partner in gospel. I may sometimes not want to get along with you, but I have to get along with you. I have to get to know you. I have to talk to you because you're a work in progress. Because you're loved. Who am I to throw in the towels and say, I'm done, we're finished with you, when God is done? That's the kind of lens we have to put on as we look at our brothers and sisters and even ourselves. That's what the book of Philippians is about. And we need to gain this perspective. As we approach and look at our partners in the gospel, we can be encouraged. Not because people around you are lovable, but because they're loved. Not because they're lovable, but because they're a work in the progress. And because they will eventually be God's masterpiece. So folks, I hope that you won't miss a Sunday until we uh, finish this series. And uh, I encourage all of you guys, I encourage all of you guys to go home and read the Epistle to the Philippines. It's only four chapters long. <laughs> See, you'll be doing yourself disservice if you do not read it ahead of the time. And, and don't just come and, and listen, you know, read the portion of the scripture that are given for each Sunday. Go home and read it. You can just finish this reading at one, one sitting in 20 minutes, 15 minutes, if you're fast reading. But read it. Think about it. And come to church and ask questions. And start training yourself to love others. Here's a final point. You know, when it comes to the cross, we emphasize forgiveness so much that we don't understand that's just half, half the message that the cross gives. Forgiveness is just half the, you know, we tell other people, you know what, you need to forgive because think about what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. He forgave us. Yes, there was forgiveness portion, but then on the flip side of the point, there was also what? Joy, actually. Did you think about that? When Jesus Christ was dying, and, you know, yes, he was you know, in, in agony and whatnot, but also when he expressed, you know what? All is finished. All is finished. I'll bet he was filled with joy, knowing that from that point on, all of his children will be sinful. And he was joyous for the fact that they will now be partners in the gospel and that one day his kingdom will be established here on the face of the earth. 
He saw all of that, and he was filled with joy. Okay. Now, folks, that's why we need to. Yes, you need to you need to forgive your brothers and sisters, but you also need to enjoy loving them. We also need to learn to love them. We also need to learn to spend time with them. We also need to learn to have patience towards them. We need to be a little more patient with our brothers and sisters. We need to give them a little more time. We need to pray for them. Because they're a work of progress. If you only think about reasons to forgive your brothers and sisters, then you're always the better person. But if you think about the reasons to enjoy your brothers and sisters, that surely celebrates the entirety of the cross, the meaning of the cross. So folks, please go home and read the Epistle to the Philippians, just four chapters long, and um, you know, come join us next week for the second part. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the fact that while we're not lovely, we're loved by you. And we're so thankful that we're loved. Not because of what we deserve, but because of who you are. Lord, we trust Jesus that you will fulfill your word. So God, we trust you to carry the word that you have begun in us into completion one day. Thank you, Christ in your name. Amen.